Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Ask Me Anything podcast. Of course, this is your Wednesday show. Tuesdays are Ryan Mickler's interview show. We do the AMAs every Wednesday. And then, of course, Friday, you can catch, uh, catch Mr. Mickler doing his Friday field notes, which is really his soapbox of anything that's uh, possibly pissing him off um, throughout the week. So stay tuned for those. I am running solo today. Uh, we'll be filling questions from uh, Mr. Mickler's Instagram account. That's at Ryan Mickler. That's M-I-C-H-L-E-R to connect with him. You could do so with that handle on both Twitter, Instagram, and of course, band with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Let's just get into this and, and let's bank through some of these questions. So uh, luckily it's Instagram. So I don't even have to figure out how to pronounce these names because who knows what these handles mean or how, how if this is even their names or not, but all uh, these names are odd. Uh, let's just say that. So uh, Dallant Marlowe. Uh, first question, should I buy a house as a young single guy or should I rent until I'm married and want to move in together? I don't think buying a home has anything to do with being married. So if financially it makes sense for you to own a home now, whether you're married or in single, then do it and pivot if you need to pivot when you get married, right? So I, I would be default aggressive from this perspective. Uh, if you think buying a house is a good idea, then buy a house. Um, and then when you get married, then you address if that changes things in regards to where you live later. But the point is, is you're not married right now. You don't know when that is stop projecting into the future of something that may not be fully present or may not come actual, or you don't know what the timeline is be present in the moment, act in the moment. If it makes sense now, then do it now and, and don't delay that. So, um, there you go. Pretty quick, quick and uh, dirty and quick. We'll go through these fairly quick. Albert, Elijah, any advice for a dysfunctional workplace? I started working for a hospital in the maintenance department. It's my first job working with all the men who have years of experience and I know their stuff. Hold on to that years of experience because that comes up later in another question here um, and all their stuff. I am entry level, so I learn as I go. Also new to the uh, constant dirty jokes in the workplace. The problem is that some of the more experienced guys are taking advantage of the lack of accountability because the boss isn't around all the time and other workers throw each other under the bus often. I feel that I always need to watch out for what I say. There are other issues, uh, but, I'm, but I am trying to stay on top of my work without being too influ uh, influenced with bad habits. So there's a lot there. Let's kind of go back any advice and he's ultimately asking for any advice around this dysfunctional type of workplace. Uh, your integrity is critical. So my advice is maintain your integrity. I, I, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. It doesn't matter if they're inconsistent. It doesn't matter if they backbite, if they undermine one another. I would focus on maintaining your integrity. Don't get into the game. Get heads down. Do your job. Become reliable. And ultimately, hopefully you end up being a shining example to these other guys to level up. Uh, there's a really high probability in this example that uh, you doing your job really, really well will piss off other guys because it makes them look bad. Uh, but that's not your job. Your job isn't to be liked by your coworkers per se. Uh, you're not being paid to uh, pander to them or their feelings or anything else. You're, you're getting paid to do a job. And so do your job and do your job damn well. Um, be kind, be empathetic. Try not to pass too much judgment on these guys. You don't know maybe all the details, or at least try to, to consider the fact that you don't know all the details. And if a guy's being laid back or whatever, I would even try not to judge him for it. Uh, and maybe just assume like, Hey, maybe something else is going on, or maybe the boss is okay or, or whatever. So focus on you, do you be an example to these other guys, uh, and rise up. And then ultimately, you know, I'm assuming this is a necessity to work in this position, maybe for a period of time. Um, but this is kind of crappy work environment, right? So, um, you know, if there's an opportunity to exit and go elsewhere, I would do it. I'd consider it. And on your exit interview, explain why, right? Uh, crappy work environment, uh, lack of accountability and et cetera. But the main thing is uh, become that reliable resource. Uh, you'll be recognized, don't worry. Um, and it's gonna show and uh, you're going to build a reputation 
And eventually guys will give you, uh, they'll, you know, they'll ride you hard for not showing up the way they show up, but push through, uh, they'll realize that nothing's going to change. Uh, and then they'll, uh, let you be and let you do you. So Jake Stout signs that you should marry the person you are dating or vice versa. Um, so this is interesting. Um, uh, Jake, I would suggest there is, this is super old school, like almost like 15 years ago, there is, um, it wasn't a Ted talk. It was like a, a Google talk. So G Google, Google talk. And, uh, the, the subject was, um, the, the paradox of choice. And it's really, really interesting because so much of the success of our choices or the results of our choices are based upon the mindset that we are in when we make the choice. Um, now, with that said, that, that's not the only driving factor behind what I'm about to say, but it's one of them. Man, if you're doubting at all whether you should marry the person you're, you're dating, then don't marry him, period. If there's doubt, don't do it. If you're confident, highly confident, and you feel great about it, then do it. But if there's any sliver of doubt, don't do it. Just keep dating and or move on. Uh, but the point is, is marriage is harder. It's not better. Anyone listening that thinks that, um, you know, we're, we're kind of close, but, you know, if we got married and we're more committed and if we have kids, we'll get closer, all that, all lies. It's going to be harder. Children make things harder. If it's not amazing now, and if you don't have great confidence now, then you're not going to get it by getting married. So um, there you go. So if you feel confident, marry the person. If you don't feel confident, wait until you do feel confident or move on into another relationship. But if there's any form of doubt there, don't, don't pull the trigger, in my opinion. The design man, you talk about your daily meeting, family meetings. What are some of the topics and or agendas that you guys try to hit every day? So I know this is specific to Ryan's conversations. Um, I know he does his family meetings in the morning. They talk about schedules. I think they do scripture reading. Uh, in the morning, address any hot topic issues. Uh, and then I do, I think they review their schedules and make sure everyone's aware of what everyone else is working on. At least, trust me, guys, I, I've heard Ryan answer this question like a bunch of times. So I'm pretty confident. Uh, I'm not missing much. Um, but it's something around that. Um, but I would focus on the, the idea of the meeting, and the fact that you're touching base as a family, and you're communicating and you have an agenda of what you're talking about and any important issues that need to be addressed in front of the family, involvement from the kids, use that as an opportunity. Like, hey, kids, we're thinking about this. What do you guys think? And involving them so you get better buy-in with your kids. Um, and then you throw like any spiritual stuff on there, whether it's scripture reading or a spiritual thought or family prayer. Man, I, I don't think you can go wrong with, with the spew of the items I just threw at you. So, um, but uh yeah, stay tuned, listen to some other apps. I mean, this question comes up quite a bit and, and Ryan covers this quite a bit because it's something really important to him, uh, him and his wife. So, um, but hopefully that helps a little bit. All right, uh, Emmer Gerster, uh, your best dad joke. <laughs> I, I contemplated whether we do this because um, it doesn't really help us level up as men. Uh, but I think it's funny. So here's, here's your best dad, dad joke. And, and you can see where I make up a bunch of stuff here. So uh, we have a place out in a small town in, in rural Utah. And I usually tell a story like this, that my sister-in-law, I'm like, oh, did you hear what happened to, you know, Crystal, for instance? Did you hear what happened to Crystal when she went to the gas station in such and such town? And someone goes, oh, what, what happened? And she's like, so she went to the gas station and um, to get some gas for like the wave runners or the boat or whatever. And while she pulled up the pump, there's a lady smoking while fueling up her car. And, and, and Crystal's like, man, crazy. And so she went into the, you know, went to the restaurant while, she, while the fuel's pumping to get some treats. And all of a sudden she sees through the window and there's a huge fire. And that lady's car, half her car's on fire. And the lady, has caught on fire that was smoking. And she runs out there. And by the time she gets out there, a local cop has already like rushed up on her, you know, grabbed her, you know, putting out the fire, you know, um, and getting her up. And, and, and Crystal runs up to see if she can help. And then all of a sudden the cop's like, 
face, puts the lady face down and starts cuffing her. And, and Crystal's like, oh my gosh, like, is she okay? And the guy, officer's like, yeah, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. She's like, why, why are you arresting her? And, and the cop goes, for waving a firearm. I think it's so funny. I, and maybe that's the tall tale sign of a dad joke is I don't need anyone to actually be listening to me right now to appreciate how funny that joke is. So there you go. There's, there's my dad joke. I got one more, one more. This is a great one. Did you hear about the celebrity that got stabbed? Um, uh, it was uh, Reese, Reese. And then you all are thinking right now, Reese Witherspoon. And I say, no, 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 with a knife. <laughs> Oh my goodness. We should just have an ep of dad jokes. That's what I think. Anyhow. All right. Moving on to more serious questions. <laughs> 22 Cheapster. Who do you look to? Who is, has lived or living for advice or wisdom on how to press on? Do you personally have a mantra, scripture, or saying that you repeat to yourself in times of doubt, frustration, or weakness? So first off, I know you guys are asking Ryan these questions because it was on his Instagram. So you are, you're getting uh, uh, tier, two, tier two support uh, on these questions. Um, but I'll, of course, you know, all I can do is share what my thoughts are. So I, I actually don't, it depends on the scenario. So, um, uh, it, you know, my, my, my father recently passed away a couple of years ago. It's, it's fresh or a couple of weeks ago. It's fresh on my mind. And so if I'm struggling and it's related to that, then, then who I might reach out to is someone that I know that their dad has passed away. Right. I, I might reach out to, to Ryan, for instance, uh, cause his dad passed away, I think a couple of years ago. Um, if it's struggling with, uh, something at work and a conflict of another relationship or whatever, then I'm going to ask someone else. Right. And so I don't have like the go-to person I go to, um, in regards to, you know, advice from that perspective, I think it really depends on the scenario, but, uh, you ask, you know, do I have a mo mantra or scripture or something? Um, I do actually. And, and so what I, part of my morning routine is I have a vision or, a, a, an affirmation that I read and, um, I've read it written, written it in a way that it moves, touches, and inspires me. When I read it, I get fired up. Um, and it's really, if I, if I read it, it, it is really a summary of how I want to create myself and how I want to show up as a man. Um, things such as, you know, if, if, if problems are, you know, come up today, that I'm going to face them head on, that I'm not going to shirk out of hopelessness or fear, that I'll address things. I'm going to honor my word. Um, I'm going to be present in the moment, you know, those kind of things. And, and so that usually that mantra or that affirmation is something that really kind of gets me aligned. Um, but, I, but I also think like clarity of mind, whether it's through meditation and prayer is also something that I, I really feel like provides that clarity. Um, but the, th the key thing, like if I had to like put something, you know, package something up of what that affirmation does for me, um, typically your struggle, right? 22 cheapster that you're talking about, it's right now, right? The, this, you're, not, you're not asking for advice like later or tomorrow. It's right now. How do I get present in the moment? And, um, and, and the moment is all you have. And so that affirmation really focuses on how I should be being or how I should show up right now in the most powerful way possible, whether it's with my kids or within work or anything. And so um, that has been a huge help for me. J. Matthew King, we are expecting our first child any day, how to continue to build a strong relationship with my wife that isn't all about the child. So I think the first thing, Jay, Matthew, is there's seasons, right? And so um, be mindful of that. Uh, the, the child, it will all be about the child, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, in, in, a, in a little while, right? for, for a little while, for both you and her. 
Uh, and that's okay. So first try not to create a bunch of meaning around like, oh, the kids, you know, like don't look into it, right? And create some story about like how the kids first and, you know, it's affecting your relationship. There's times and seasons to things. Brand new babies is one of those seasons where it's going to be tough. You're going to get minimal sleep and mom is going to be 100% focused on baby for the most part. Uh, and that's okay. So don't, don't make that wrong. Now, with that said, um, the other way that you make sure that you build a strong relationship with your wife is be relevant. So what are you doing to show up uh, to help her in this process? How are you banding with her to make um, this experience of having a child together the best possible thing? Um, and it might be everything from, you know, maybe you guys choose to, you know, bottle and breastfeed. So then that way you can participate in that process to ease up the burden. Um, maybe it's you always changing the diapers, you know, maybe use line up things so she can get out of the house and get away and do her own thing without you to have some clarity of mind. So you, you need to figure out what, how you need to be relevant and provide value to her. And that's going to strengthen your relationship together. Um, and this is this uh, our first child. So this is going to be tough, right? This is like a whole new bag that you guys are going to have to deal with um, and, and over, over communicate. Um, and you might want to set these expectations now, right? Like, Hey, babe, like I would love, I mean, I, I think every wife would love to hear, Hey, babe, I, you know, I want to continue to make sure that our relationship is strong. That's not all about the baby and that you and I are growing together, you know, as a, a precursor to the, before the baby shows up, what things can we do or what start talking through what I might be able to do to help you so we can do this together as much as humanly possible, right? And map that out. And then when it doesn't work or that's not working or she needs something else, then pivot. But ask those questions, babe, how am I doing? What else can I do? You know what I mean? And, and, and take care of all the other things that don't have to do with the baby. Jace 44, Glenn, how does a young man handle getting over a girl? It was an ugly ending the right way when we have mutual friends. So how do we get over it? Uh, getting over a girl the right way when we have mutual friends. Um, well, if it's ugly that I'm assuming that there is uh, some emotional hardship and bad feelings. Uh, so first off, uh, you need to own that and own whatever it is for you to own. So if this relationship is partially failed on your part, you got to own that shit. Like none of this bullshit, like, oh, it's her fault. No, no, no. Not like you guys are probably broken up because you aren't that amazing. Um, and uh, you're probably a complete asshole and whatever. And, and I'm obviously, I don't know you, Jace. So I don't even know if that's true. But the point is, is like, figure out what you did wrong in the relationship and own it. So first off, take some extreme ownership. Second, have some empathy. And don't make her wrong and run some story about she's this way. And then, uh, you know what? The, the reality of it is she's who she is and you are who you are. And you both chose not to accept the other person for who they are. It's that simple. And, um, and try to let go, have some empathy. I think there's huge power in, in understanding people and, um, and not trying to make them wrong per se. And, and so find some empathy there. Don't talk shit about her. Own your, your part in the relationship, how, why it potentially failed. Um, and when there's an opportunity and your friends, like maybe they want to talk shit about her, don't ask them to. They're like, hey, you know, don't talk shit about her. You know, I still care about her. She's a, you know, we dated for a while. I have, I have feelings for her. She's a great person. I hope the best for her. And then, and then truck on and, and don't, don't get into the gossip. Uh, be impeccable, impeccable with your word um honor your word and honor her and honor your relationship you had with her by not talking shit myland makito nine i need to get better at being confident in social settings especially in groups how would i go about building this confidence and improving this skill i'm already getting out there as much as possible okay so um, i'm going to pull up a resource really quick in the Iron Council, as you guys know, it's our uh, our mastermind, our exclusive brotherhood uh, that's kind of tied to the order of man to learn more about that. By the way, it's open, I think, until like just a few more days 
So if you're on the fence of joining the Iron Council, uh, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council to learn more. Um, with that said, we covered this book just like a month or two ago. And so uh, I'll reference this. So The Confidence Gap. So Confidence Gap by Stephen Hayes. So I would, I'd recommend reading that book. And then the other part um, I would suggest, and I was really thinking about this because one thing um, at, at our company we're, we're focusing on employee development and it was asked, someone asked me if I'd be willing to teach the courses on public speaking um, and presenting with clients. And, and it kind of really caused me like, oh, well, you know, what makes, what makes me good at this? Like what makes me good at speaking to clients or speaking in large, large audiences? And, and, I, and I immediately went with tactics, right? I went with like, oh, well, uh, you got to watch body language and you got to do your grammar and seem genuine. And, you know, and it's all this, excuse my French, but it's like all this shit, like, like smoke and mirrors. And, and then I realized like, ultimately what it comes down to is whatever I'm talking about, I'm passionate about. Like I have a strong opinion about it. And, and I care enough about what I'm talking about that it's not about me. It's about something else. It's about this, right? It's about restoring masculinity. It's about standing for other men to rise up and become better versions of themselves for their families, for their communities, for much other things. When it, when it comes to work, it's about the importance of helping an organization with that particular system, right? And I, and I feel really passionate about it. And so I think by being passionate about it and being authentic about what you're doing, it, everything else kind of works out, right? And so in this example, you're saying more confident in social settings with groups. Well, why are you in the social settings, right? Like, why, why do you even care? Why, do you, why, why is this even a, a question? And I'm assuming the question might be like, well, I feel uncomfortable. Okay, well, who are you thinking about when you feel uncomfortable? You. So don't go, don't be in social groups about you. Go to group settings, be in social settings and make it about other people. Make it about having a great conversation with someone, about getting to know someone, about listening to them and understanding them and moving on. And I think the less you make it about you, and the more you make it about the other individuals that you're getting to know and serve and possibly have a great relationship with, you're not going to be worried about the confidence because you're not, you, you've, you've, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You've transcended the superficial of being concerned about what people think about you. Okay. Now I know that's easier said than done. However, here's one more tidbit and just a little bit of a hack, I guess. Everyone is constantly worried about looking good and avoidance of looking bad. It like really get present to that. Like really like grab that, put it on your lap and really sit with it. People walk around all the time trying to look good, right? If there's any nervousness that I have on doing this podcast today, it's not about like, oh, I sure hope I... I uh, say something that might be impactful to someone. Hell no. Like the only nervousness that I have is I don't want to look like an ass or I don't want to look like an idiot. Well, that's what everyone's doing, by the way. Everybody. We get dressed. We put on the clothes that we put on. Why? Because we want people to think about the way we, you know, we want them to think about us. We're, we're worried about what we say. Why? Because we want to look good. Uh, we may not speak up and say certain things because we don't want to look bad. Like, Everyone is doing this game. So also realize that in a group setting that everyone is concerned about, they're not concerned about the way you look. They're more engulfed about being concerned about the way they look. That's what their priority is, not you and pacing judgment on you. And so just realize that everyone's walking around kind of in this matrix of like self-absorbed concerns about what it, people think about each other, what, well, what people think about them that, um, and, and use that to your benefit. Because everyone's concerned about the same thing. So there you go. There's my spiel, man. How to quit drinking and ways to deal with triggers. Shit, man. So first off, um, 
I am unqualified, obviously, uh, to even answer this question. Um, and damn it, I was going to grab a book. Um, when I saw this question, brother, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I was going to grab a book. Damn, I wish I would have grabbed it because it was really insightful. Um, I'll, I'll try to illustrate. So, um, man, I don't even remember the book is. It's on my desk. So, first off, if there's, if there's alcoholism involved, right, and it's gone beyond <laughs> just like, hey, I want to quit. Well, let's just pause. If you're, try, if you're having this question, like I, I'm trying to quit drinking, you have a problem. Is that fair? So alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous is probably like world-renowned. We all know that that is a highly effective system. Now, with that said, I do think the one thing I can say to this is the process of people changing is rooted in, and I know this sounds kind of weird, and, and, and Sean, I don't even know if you're a religious guy, but the religious people may appreciate this. It's the repentance process is also the same exact process for growth, learning, and change. It's like the same exact formula. Just switch out the words a little bit. So number one is you got to take ownership. Or actually, let's stop you need to accept the fact that there's a problem. That's the first sign, right? No, no one's ever going to change anything if they haven't came to the realization that like, hey, you know what? Maybe I have a problem here, right? I'm waking up in the morning and the first thing I'm doing is drinking, right? Like that's like the tall tale sign of alcoholism. By the way, like I had a roommate in college that was like completely never drank. And then within three, probably at three months, this kid's like almost drunk every single day, all day long, right? It was a disaster. Anyhow, one Come to the realization that there's a problem. Number two, take ownership of it. Now, ownership as in don't be a victim. Like, oh, I got a drink your problem. But, it, you know, my mom and dad raised me poorly. And, you know, no, stop all that shit, right? It's in your control. Take ownership that, hey, where you are, you've gotten yourself in this position. And then I'd say number three is, and I, I don't even know if this is in the book. It's just coming to me, is get present to the impact. What is the probable future if you do not change? And by the way, that's such a powerful question for everything. If anyone's like struggling with make, making a question like, hey, should I move on? Or uh, should we make some adjustments in our marriage? Or um, oh, is little Timmy making these shitty decisions? Is he going to be, is he going to be okay in the future? Here you go. Based upon the current decisions, based upon your current actions, what is the probable future if you don't make a change? That is a really powerful conversation to have with yourself to get present to the impact that your drinking is probably going to have on you. And I would get really into this, right? Like if you're a single guy, then say, you know, am I going to be able to get married? Am I going to, what, how does this affect my chances of finding the kind of woman I want to be with? If we have children, and I don't give this up and I'm drinking on a regular basis. What's the probability of uh, domestic violence? What's the probability of child abuse? What's the possibility of my kids latching onto the same exact habit and justifying it in their lives because I was unable to address this myself? What's the probability of me showing up in my family to provide, protect, and preside over them when I'm sedating myself on a regular basis? Like, if you really get deep to this, the impact is huge. And then I'd fo start focusing on the triggers and then the other processes that you would get through Alcoholics Anonymous and et cetera. Um, a good book on triggers, I would say, is probably the book on triggers is Atomic Habits. Um, look at me all referencing books like there's no tomorrow. Um, I don't have it up. I was going to pull up who the author is, but just Google that. Atomic Habits, uh, James Clear. Uh, great book on triggers. Um, but brother, like also don't think you have to do this by yourself, right? And uh, there's a reason why there's organizations that help men with addictions. And um, don't fall into that thing that like, I'm a lone wolf. I'm going to have to figure this shit by myself. Like uh, you might need outside help to pull this off. So best of luck, brother. We have uh, many guys in the Iron Council that have had huge success with becoming sober. And so uh, 
from my understanding, this is a really difficult thing. And so best of luck to you. Robbie Luffel, in what way, if any, do you treat your daughter differently than your son? Are you as tough when delivering a punishment? Do you tickle her just as hard? I am harder on my boy and he's three and my girls are 10 and eight. <laughs> so I'm harder on the three-year-old possibly. Um, ironically though, my mom, uh, their mom is harder on the girls than she is with the boy. And so I think it kind of balances itself out a little bit. Now, with that said, am I soft on my girls? No, I am not soft with my girls at all. Um, they are tough. Um, I expect them to be able to control their emotions. They need to put themselves in check if they're, you know, being overly crazy and emotional. Um, and the expectation is that we talk through things, uh, that it's okay to be upset, but we don't lash out. We don't lose control of our emotions and we need to talk through them and they need to own them. Uh, they know that if they're upset, that that's a choice that they've made. And I help them make a better choice through, through that conversation. So, um, so I don't take a light on them. Um, but am I sweeter to my girls? Am I a little bit more gentle with them? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, I am. And, and I don't think, I don't know. I don't know why I do that. Uh, it feels natural. And so I'm, even though I hold them accountable and I ex have expectations of them and how they show up and, and establish boundaries and rules in the house, um, I'm a little bit kinder to them. And, and one thing that has really resonated with me over the years, and, and Robbie, I don't know if you, how old your daughter is, um, but if she's younger and, you know, like, a, like still a baby or whatever, um, or if she's older, you've probably heard this, but, you know, my daughters have gotten in debates with my wife about why they can't marry me when they get older. And, uh, and I think, and trust me, I'm not the only one here. Many guys, our daughters do this because you're their first love and you set the precedence of what a man should be, uh, in their life. And you're going to be the measuring stick of what they select when they get older. And so I think part of knowing that I, I treat them how I'd want a man to treat them, uh, if they were older, right. And they were married or had a boyfriend. And so I treat them that way. I'm I, now don't get me wrong. I'm not a pushover. Cause I also don't want them to marry a man. That's a pushover and a, a Mr. Nice guy. Right. Um, but I open, open the doors for them because I want to set a precedence that a guy should open the door for them, you know? And so I, I really try to, uh, emulate what the kind of man that I want them to focus and look for when they get older. Hopefully that helps Robbie. Texas Seth, Seth. What's a good way to start discovering your why? So, man, I, I, I kind of struggle with this. Um, well, I have a couple ideas. So I fall in the camp that there's no like, uh, and, 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 and Seth, I know I'm not saying that you're saying this, uh, but just to lay out some groundwork. Um, we create this, right? I, I, don't, I don't like the idea that like, you know, find, like find my purpose or find my why, like it's this thing that I need to discover. Um, I think it's something that you get to create. Um, and so, so that's number one, it's your creation. Number two, to lay groundworks here, groundwork item number two is if you took knowledge and, and we had a pie chart of knowledge in that pie chart, a, a section of that is stuff you know, right? You know these things, like you're an expert in certain areas. You know how to, uh, you know, wipe your butt, right? And you know how to drive a car. And you, 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 there's things you know, right? Or even in your profession, you know. And then there's a, a, a slice of knowledge that is that you, you know, you don't know, right? So I know I don't know how to do brain surgery, right? I know I don't know how to do AutoCAD drafts um, of plans. And I know I don't know how to do a bunch of things. And then there's this huge slice that is, you don't know that you don't know it. Now, 
I actually think part of life is to dip into that. Don't know what you don't know. Um, and, and I try to hold on to that often because we sometimes think we, we, we look at life from the context of what we know and, and we judge and place like if, whether something is right or wrong or whatever, based upon the context of our current knowledge. And it's amazing how, if you just knew more, what you don't know, what you don't know, you don't know how your context of life would drastically change. And so, um, now with that said, your quote unquote, why might be over there. And so when I think about discovering your why it's about taking action and constant pivoting and seeing what connects. Now there's a handful of things that we all kind of know that we excite us, things that you're passionate about, things that, um, you might have a strong opinion about go after those. And look for opportunities to serve or develop yourself in those areas and just experiment and create experiences of learning. And I think that's kind of how you find it uh, or create it for that matter is, um, yeah, going after it and trying things out. Um, a good example, and, and Ryan's used it so many times, and yeah, I'll just regurgitate his story, but like, you know, the Order Man of Podcasts originated from him starting a financial services podcast. He didn't even know he liked podcasting until he did a subject around financial services. And then once he did that, he's like, wow, I really love this podcast thing, but I don't like the conversation. So I'm going to change the conversation about something I'm more passionate about. And, you know, six, five, you know, five, six years later, you know, here we are order man podcast. So um, I think it really requires action and you putting yourself out there and trying things and, and, and seeing how they, how they uh, click, you know, and see if they resonate and see if there's, there's something there that kind of gets you fired up. Um, but I'd really focus on those areas of your life that uh, you're already kind of passionate about that you feel like you can get behind. And, and maybe this might be fun consideration for us to think about. What is a why? What's that mean? Start discovering your why. And, and, and if I had to guess what you're saying, Seth, and what most people say when they say why is how do you find a greater purpose to life so you find fulfillment in, in how you show up? And so I think really what we're asking is how do I find fulfillment in life and have a greater impact so my life actually means something? At least that's what why is for me. And so if you look at it that way, it's like, okay, well, how do you find fulfillment? How do you make a difference? How do you leave a legacy? What's the impact that you can create? What's the area that is lacking that needs someone to rise up uh, and fill a void that is such a, a dire thing? Uh, a way I've heard this before, uh, we all have problems, right? It's like time. You, you can ask someone that's retired and you can say, how's things going? And they won't say like, oh, I'm so bored. You know, I don't have any. Yeah, no, they're, they're all, I'm so busy. Everyone's always busy. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Time fills up things and people get busy regardless of whatever it is that they have going on. I think problems are the same way. Everyone has problems. People that have a fulfilled life ch choose their problems. That's it. So go find a problem and make it your own and find fulfillment and purpose in tackling a problem. And instead of sitting back and letting who the current president is be your problem or creating drama in your family being your problem. And trust me, everyone has problems, but people that elevate themselves and have a greater impact in the world, they chose their problem. So go find one. Brady Barrow, what is your, uh, oh, I'm gonna skip that question. Sorry, Brady. <laughs> uh, Zombie cult, how much fear did you have before launching the podcast? I'm about to launch mine and I'm scared shitless. Maybe I shouldn't mention that. Uh, I mean, let me say this, zombie. I, I, can't, I can't talk for Ryan on this one. I, I actually don't know how he'd answer this. Um, but I would assume, is he nervous about it? Yeah, probably because he cares. So just like, uh, you know, when I have to record solo, even when we do podcasts every week, I'm a little nervous going into these. Um, and I think it's a sign of, of, of caring. Now, with that said, 
kind of back to what I said earlier, right? Like, why are you scared? Is it is it about looking good? Is it because you don't want judgments of the other people? Is it because blah, blah, blah? Well, you get past that by making it bigger than you. You get past that by focusing on the bigger issue, not necessarily about how you look, but trying to leave an impact. Ryan shares a story and I, I, I won't go into the whole story, but I've latched on to the saying that he said, you won't realize your impact or what you're capable of until you're willing to light yourself on fire and let people watch. My definition, or at least what I've let that mean for me when I hear him say that, is willing to be pointed at, willing to be laughed at, willing to watch people burn, have you burn yourself because why? You're committed to something bigger. And the purpose of what you're here, the purpose of why I'm on this podcast today is not to look good, not to lift up my ego. It's an attempt to, to leave a lasting impact and a stand for other men. So focus on the bigger purpose. If you're looking for advice on how to get past you know, the nervousness. All right. How do I get my butt up early? Uh, oh, sorry. Rev Williams, T. Rev Williams. How do I get my butt up early so that I have more time to be productive, exercise, and be generally more productive and badass? I like it. Be badass. Um, get up early. That's the answer. Sorry, T. Rev. That's, I, I know you're, uh, how's this? Prep the night before. Eliminate boundaries, make it easier to get up early and get productive. Remove the barriers that makes it hard. Um, but most importantly, get up and do it. That's it, man. And, and, and maybe the tall tale sign is if you're bitching, like the, the sign that you're bitching out is the minute you have to excuse why you shouldn't. Alarm goes off, ding, 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 ding. And the minute you start going, oh man, I didn't get good enough sleep. Maybe I should, you're bitching out. So if you have to excuse it or come up with a reason in your own mind, that's when you just say, you know what? No, that's not how I'm going to show up in life. And then just get up anyway. Uh, but prep the night before. Uh, that's the big thing, right? Should we lose sleep? No, you actually shouldn't lose sleep. You actually should get a huge amount of sleep, eight to nine hours, and you should feel great about it. So what do you need to do to get up early? Go to bed earlier. Get your workout clothes on. Put them, you know, already have set up. Eliminate the barriers of having to... Um, get up. And, and I've already referenced this like atomic habits, you know, you might want to, you know, hack life a little bit and figure out what you need to do to, um, uh, generate those habit forming, uh, and, and utilize triggers as part of your benefit of, of getting passes. So check that book out as well. If you haven't already. All right. Uh, chatty bop, bop, chatty bop. What's your morning routine? Um, this is fun. I, I was actually on a just podcast yesterday and we were talking about this. So, um, I think the miracle morning is a great book in regards to morning routines. Um, I've taken that and kind of create my own Kip version, my Kipisms. So, um, this is what I do. So first up, I hop up and I go immediately, well, I pound a pre-workout, criticize me all you want. So I take my legalized crack, uh, my pre-workout and I go to the gym. I cannot meditate. I can't do anything first because then I'll just fall right back to sleep. So the first thing you do, I get up, take my pre-workout. I go to the gym. I work out. Once I come back from my workout, um, I go outside. Most cases, I go outside and I meditate for five minutes. And what that meditation looks like, it used to be like guided meditations, like I'd listen to Headspace or other meditations. Now I just lis listen to the sky. And I just sit there, try to clear my mind, hear the birds currently right now, because spring has started right Hear the birds, hear the wind hitting the trees. When thoughts enter my mind, I just let them go, focus on my breathing. And I do that for five minutes. After that, I hop back into the house. I grab my journal and I write a page of something that I'm grateful for. And I explain why I, why I am grateful for it. After I'm done writing that one page in my journal, I grab my card. I already talked about it earlier, my affirmation card, and I read that affirmation. After I read the affirmation, I grab my phone, I pull up my calendar for the day, and then I visualize, based upon that affirmation, I visualize how does that man show up based upon my day, right? So I might go, okay, it's Monday, um, recording a podcast. Okay, well, based upon what I just read, like how should I show up? When I walk into the podcast studio, how, how should I communicate on the mic? 
Oh, I got jujitsu in the afternoon. How does that man walk into the gym? How do I communicate with individuals? How do I roll? Am I passive aggressive? Am I overly aggressive? Am I um, articulate in my moves? Am I thought provoked? Am I fully present? How does that man go from the office and walk into the house? Am I pissed off? I throw my bag down. If the house is a mess, do I, am I huffing and puffing? Or do I see my kids? Am I excited? Do I ask them how their day was? How does that man also show up to dinner? And how do we have dinner as a family? What kind of questions does he ask his wife? Like, what does that look like, right? How does that man show up? And then ultimately, how do I spend the rest of the evening with my wife? That's my morning routine. Peter's 34. What is your go-to Brazilian jiu-jitsu takedown for a larger opponent of equal skill? Um, man, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, you think, right? Black belt and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I'd have this down. So uh, I have a couple, you know, like if I were, if we're talking gi, um, I would focus on collar grab, sleeve grab. And then I'd probably cross collar grab to arm drag. I'd probably arm drag would probably be the number one thing. Um, it generated scramble, worst case, maybe you can arm drag and then come into a double leg or a single leg, depending on how they scrabble. I'm not good enough with like my judo trips and stuff or throws. Um, so I just a good old classic arm drag. Um, if it's no gi, um, I, I'm not very good with my singles and double legs. So I might attempt an outside single leg. So I don't expose myself. Right. And then there's a little bit of chase scramble possible back take from there. So an out, outside single leg, or I don't do anything. And I let my opponent shoot in so I can focus on the guillotine or the Kimura. <laughs> Uh, and especially on a bigger component, right? Like opponent, like pulling guard, probably not a good idea, right? You don't want that guy on top of you. And now that I say even the arm drag, like, and, and I think if the arm drag's done effectively, um, you're not going to throw him on you, right? You're, you're arm dragging him off to the side of you or collar dragging off to the side of you. And so um, that, that's a, I think that's a safe takedown for a big guy as well. So, um, so no gi. I wait for them to shoot so I can go look for the Kimura or a gi team. Gi, I'll do a sleeve, cross collar grab to a drag, or or actually, you know, I might go for a, a, an arm drag on no gi or an outside single. There you go. Uh, let's see. Mr. Jed Wise, in a digital world, how does a man meet a woman? Jed, I'm sorry, man, but... I think the appropriate question is how does a man not meet a woman in a digital world? Like we went from like the only girls in my village are, you know, four ladies in my village and, and I'm going to have to choose one of those to uh, I can hop online and go to eharmony.com and probably thousands of other online websites and have options of millions of people. So um, geez, I, I don't know how you not meet a woman on, you know, in our current world. Yeah, man, use, use the tools. I, I don't actually, I'm not against digital dating. I, I, I wouldn't, I'd be careful to base your digital relationship as a solid relationship to get married. I mean, I think eventually you got to meet in person and get to know the individual and it has to transcend, you know, far greater than digitally meeting one another. But um, I, I think the opportunities to meet women are, are really high. Um, if, if anything, it's probably really easy. Maybe just to add to your question is, um, go where the kind of women you are looking for are located. You know what I mean? So, um, if you don't want to find a shameless hussy, well, don't go to the strip club, you know, go somewhere else. So, um, like church for instance, or maybe at the gym or, you know, in other hobbies that you might have. So, uh, go where they are, uh, and and most importantly, make sure that you're showing up as a man that uh, is is um, in a position to attract those kind of women that you that you're seeking for. Bob Runner twelve eleven. What are the most important things to focus on as a man on raising a daughter, a two years old firstborn? 
Uh, Bob, I, I would go back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, who you are as a man in their life is what they're going to measure uh, the kind of man they should marry. So I would very, just be very present and be that kind of man that you, that you hope your daughter finds when she gets older and show up that way. I think that's the most important thing to focus on. Yeah. I kind of already answered it earlier. So hopefully that was helpful earlier. Jackson Jenkins, is it better to play the long game and stick with a company that rewards tenor or jump companies in effort to build income quicker? I'm a project manager at a utility company, but trying to increase my income to tackle Dave Ramsey's baby steps. I'm currently working three jobs and would like to cut back to only one. Mm. So I don't think those are only two options, right? You, you said stay at a company long game that uh, rewards tenor or jump companies and make income quicker. I don't know what industry, well, you did mention what industry, I don't know, maybe it's harder to find these companies, but man, I think both of those suck ass, right? So one, I'll just share my opinion when I hire people. If people are selecting us because we're paying them more money than the next company, that's not an employee I want. <laughs> Seriously, I want the employee that wants to work for us because of the alignment of our company values and the kind of company we are. That, that's more important to me and if someone comes here because, well, you know, the, you, if you guys pay me more, I'll come here. But otherwise, I want to go somewhere else. I'd be like, go somewhere else then. It, it's, an, it's a benefit to work here. And, uh, and if there's proper alignment, then they come here. Now, with that said, we don't really reward tenor. We, we reward effectiveness. So if you come and you bust ass and you're doing an amazing job, you're going to get rewarded. I mean, this idea that like, oh, you stuck around and was mediocre for the last 10 years. So let's uh, give you a raise. You really want to work for a company like that? Screw that. I hate that too. So I say find a company that does both for you, that you can come in, make some additional money because you're bringing value and that will continue to benefit you and reward you based upon the effectiveness that you bring to the table. Now, if I had to choose between these two, Man, I don't know. That's my answer. I'm sticking with my answer, Jackson. That's my answer, man. I, I, I think you can get exactly what you're looking for. I, I don't think you need to settle for, for one of those. I think you can get both. Jared Porter, how do you escape side control? There's like jujitsu questions going on today. So how do you escape side control? Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a couple tips. So uh, so they're past your guard, right? And they already have you in side control. So the first off is don't let them get cross face and bunker in. So you got to stop that at all. Like protect the neck during, while someone's passing your guard, do not let them get cross face on you. Uh, once that's covered and they can't get cross face and you're agitating that arm that's trying to get cross face, you, you, you're in a position to escape. Um, and so whether that's passing the arm over, whether that's controlling hip, but the, the key thing I would focus on is, um, maintaining, getting a knee in to side control. So you can start getting a guard back. If you can't get a knee in, look at using one of your legs to hook their leg and pull it away. So you can maybe even under hook and start working onto their back. But the main thing is prevent the cross face from occurring. Um, maintain some hip control. Be careful. Don't use your wrist. I always use my forearm so you don't get wrist locked when they roll their hips towards you, but, uh, focus on getting a knee in, maintaining distance, protect the neck. There you go. It's hard to do that over a podcast. We should just do some videos for you guys. Dad vibes, best way to learn new information, book, class, podcast, and et cetera. All of it is great ways to learn new information. I would suggest that you look into, dad vibes, look into Bloom's taxonomy. And it's a triangle of how people learn and comprehend data. The ability to read something and regurgitate it is the lowest form of understanding. You got to move past it. And, and if you think about it, there's ways to do that. For instance, 
we've talked about on this podcast already, I've already given you tons of advice, right? Whether it's a morning ritual, uh, whether it's uh, writing the affirmations, uh, it, determining your why, et cetera. Pause and or after this, grab a notebook and act. Scenario-based training, action learning, grab it and apply it. If it's a book, don't read the whole book and then lose half the shit that you read that was valuable. Stop or put a, a dog ear on it. Come back and implement it and see how it works and see what, what doesn't work and pivot and adjust and massage it and, and actually apply it in everyday scenarios. That's how we ultimately learn where we might get the ideas from book, classes, podcasts, and et cetera. I, I, I think it's indifferent, right? Classes are, is a class someone le lecturing you any different than you reading a book or a podcast? Yeah, I think they're all kind of similar, right? They're, they're means of gathering data and ideas, but the locking in of the knowledge doesn't occur until we actually apply it to a scenario of some sort. So I'd focus on application, action learning. Mason Williams, 1993. I struggle with having hard conversations with my wife. I feel she isn't very perceptive to it. How can I improve with communicating to guide her to be more acceptive? Re oh, to guide her to be more receptive. This is good. Why isn't she receptive? And why is the conversation hard? Ask that question first. And it's probably hard and it's receptive because it comes across as a form of an attack of some sort that she is not doing something right, or you're asking her to change or whatever it is. So let's, let's come up with a scenario uh, really quick. I'm not very good at these audibles scenario based uh, ideas, but let's come up with this scenario and then let's walk through this. So geez, I'm so lame. Let's go with, um, Let's go with something that pisses me off, typically. Okay. My wife is always late for church, typically. And it's no big deal because she doesn't listen to the podcast. In fact, she doesn't even know about Order of Man. I've kept this secret for all these years. <laughs> I'm joking. So she's always late and I've reached my threshold. I'm just pissed off about it. And I want to talk to her about it. And at first glance, let's be honest. Let's all be honest. I want to talk to her about it. Why? Because I want her to change, right? So, so, and if I approach it from the perspective of, hey, age, you know, I really want to talk to you about something that's, you know, really important to me or whatever. And I start off that, you know, whenever you're late for church, it really, you know, here's all the impact and it makes us late, our, us kids late, it makes me look bad. And I hate walking down and everyone's already there. And I look like a schmuck. And well, you, you really set the precedence that church isn't important by showing up late all the time, whatever. And you tell her your story. How's that going to go? Probably not that well. And that is a hard conversation. Why? Because you're attacking someone and you're thinking they should do something different. You know what's not hard conversation is to tell her why something's your fault. That's not hard. It's hard for you, but it's not hard for her. And is she going to be receptive to you owning something and apologizing for the way you showed up? Yeah, that's easy for her. Everyone will be receptive to that. So my suggestion is, you don't go like, first off, this is really interesting. And you could do, you can ask people things, right? You can ask things of your spouse. You can say, honey, would you be willing to, or would you consider doing something? But, but ultimately she's her own person. She has freedoms and she could do whatever the shit she wants, whether you like it or not. And it's funny because we coerce people into doing what we think they should do. And we kind of take away their freedom of choice by like creating ultimatums, right? I'm going to be an asshole to you if you don't do what I want you to do. Now, we don't say that, but we do it in our actions. And so in that same example, the way you would handle this or the way I would handle this is, you know, honey, there, I want to talk to you about something that, that I need to own. Oh, yeah, what's going on? If you notice, I was probably really agitated earlier today, and I want to apologize. Oh, apologize for what she says. Well, 
as you know, one of the things I really like when we show up to church late, I have a tendency to immediately start judge, being judgmental towards you. I get all ornery and it makes me feel like you don't appreciate something that, that is important to me. And I know that's not even true. And that's my interpretation of what that means. Um, so I actually want to apologize because I'm sure you're not intentionally being late just to, you know, razz me or to make a point that I'm not important or you're not willing to consider what I want. Um, and so I want to apologize for that. And I just want to communicate that it's kind of riled up and, and that's kind of what it was. And so that really bothers me. Um, so my apologies for that. That's it. Now you might want to throw in, or you might consider throwing in like, Hey, hun, you know, if, if you can, or if you're willing, I'd really appreciate if we could try to get to church on time. It'd be really meaningful to me. In fact, I was wondering what can I do uh, to make that happen? If I got up a little bit earlier, or maybe I, I tackle the kids, I'll get the kids all ready. If I did that, would that allow that to be maybe even more possible? Well, what, what can I do to, because it's important to me, um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm sure it's even important to you, right? And I have a tendency to, this is kind of a trigger for me. And I know it's a little silly, but what can I do to make sure that, um, that we can maybe make that happen? I think she'd be receptive. Zach Valdez, what hardships have you faced in entrepreneurship and where did you, uh, and how did you overcome them? Um, so first off, I, uh, I started, geez, 06, I think 06, 07 is when I started working for myself. Um, and Ryan, of course, I started working for himself probably about what, six years ago as well, uh, maybe even seven maybe even more than that, actually, now that I think about it. Um, but regardless, what hardships did I face? Uh, the balance is, is probably the hardest. Um, I was good at what I did from a consulting perspective. But when you first start, you're not just like, at least for me, I'm not just a consultant. I'm, I'm the sales director. I'm the marketing expert. I'm the, uh, and, and I'm the professional services guy. And so the balance of constantly jumping in between those where I'd focus on sales so much and then I'd get too much sales. I didn't have enough resources to get the work done. I'd get heads down on the work. I'd focus too much on that. Then all of a sudden I'd lose sales momentum and then I'd have to do some marketing and then I'd get distracted. Like just that balance of the different roles required um, to do my own thing was probably one of the hardest hardships. The other one was getting over the perceived sense of stability. And, and I say perceived because it, it's not true. We, we have a tendency sometimes to think like the most stable thing is to work for corporate America. Uh, it'll be a stable company and the company's not going anywhere. And we think because the company's not going nowhere that we're not going anywhere. But, but the correlations and the variables between you working and your success in a large corporation is like huge. I mean, you could be an amazing employee and be highly effective and still get laid off. But when you work for yourself and you bust your ass and you're working hard, the correlation between that and success are like almost a one-to-one. -one. And so I do think it's perceived stability. Uh, and it's really not. It's just, it's in your hands and you haven't delegated out the stability to someone else. And so getting over that was, was critical to me. Um, but um, I, I want to give you some tip tips here, Zach. So the other thing I, I consider that was a, a tip for me to get past the um, how to balance my time between sales and work um, and, and, and probably farming a clients. Like that was another, yeah, that was another struggle was how do I, how do I come across genuine to my clients and not trying to sell them and be desperate and, and really just provide a service to them. And really what I did is my focus was impressions. Every month I'd leave an impression and that impression could be an email that I just shoot off and say, Hey, you know, how's things going? 
We just recently did a project that was really similar to what we did for you guys. So you came to mind, you know, just checking in and see, you know, if there's any need for our assistance, blah, blah, blah. Or I might send uh, tech updates about, hey, these are the latest things that you guys should really know about that's really critical. And here's some recommendations. Um, or here's another vendor that I started working with that you guys might want to connect. And, and are, if you're interested, I'll connect you guys some value, some impression on a monthly basis to all my existing clients. That was critical. The other critical aspect was quality work. I used the example of the hole in the wall restaurant. It's funny, strategically, we'll look at a business plan and you could go, okay, business plan, you need the restaurant in a really great location uh, where a lot of good foot traffic, signage and branding is super critical. Like you can come up with all these things that will drive business. And then all of a sudden you see this anomaly of an amazing hole in the wall restaurant that is so damn good. And it's in a shitty location and a shitty building. The logo sucks ass and it's like too small. They don't have enough like tables for everybody, but there's a line outside to get in. Why? Because the quality of work is superior. It's the same thing with consulting, man. Quality of work that we do will speak for itself. Clients will refer to one another. When, when a person leaves one company and goes to another company, they bring you along. So I'd really focus quality, quality, quality in all that you do. Do it an amazing way. And, and one tactic that I've used in the past is when I do a project, and I don't do it anymore, and we should probably reinstigate this. But what I used to do in the past is we'd have our project scope, and I look at the project scope, and I would identify how do we wow. This is what the client wants. We're going to deliver this and we're going to deliver it in budget and in this timeline, but how do we wow them? Where's the wow factor? And it's different for every client. A wow factor for this client is, man, they have a crunch timeline. If we got this done even earlier than planned, that's a wow factor. Or this client really cares about the user experience and the polish and how nice things look. There's our wow. Over communication, that's our wow. Identify what the wow is. We don't want a happy client. We want a wowed client, someone that was like, dude, it was amazing working with you guys, refreshing, not just, yeah, you guys did pretty good. That's not good enough. Wow. Look for the wow factor in what you do. Pen already writer. How can I be involved in your work? I am only starting to have, ha I'm only starting to have my own source of income. And my parents don't want to pay anything for me. <laughs> Good parents, by the way. So I want to be involved in a way that is affordable. So he wants to be involved in a way that's affordable. And he just started his own source of income. And he wants to help Mr. Mickler. So I'm going to give you a tip. Your tip is you come to the table and you tell him what you can do. You just wasted his time. How can I get involved? Yeah, he's going to spend 30 minutes and think about all the possible things that you could, he could possibly use you for. You don't think he's probably heard this in 20 different ways? No, no. You figure out what your talents are, what you can bring to the table, what you're going to do different than everybody else, a min, uh, your unique selling proposition, what makes you different than other people that want to get on the bandwagon and help. And then you pitch, I can help in this ways. This is how it would benefit you. This is my commitment to it. And then you share that information. Bobby Cox 11. What should I do to start building mental toughness and grit, grit in my son? What age is appropriate? My son is only four. So sometimes I feel like I'm being too hard on him or expecting too much. For example, some mornings he's in a bad mood and refuses to dress himself when in fact he can dress himself easily and does every morning. He usually says things like, I can't and cries and whines. Again, he's only four, so I try not to be too hard on him. I just don't know where the line is. Oh, man, this is a good question. And it's good, and this is good for me too, Bobby. So I, so I have a three-year-old uh, right now. And of course I have, he's my six. So I have five other kids that I've, gone past the age of four, obviously. Um, but this idea of mental toughness is super 
valuable. Um, one thing that Ryan has said to me in the past that I really like is don't lose sight of what you're trying to learn or what you're trying to get them to learn. You really don't want little Timmy to get dressed. You want him to learn to be consistent and be able to do it himself, right? And, and you've already alluded to it, but don't lose sight of what we're trying to accomplish, right? It's not that the room needs to be clean. We want our kids to learn the importance of being organized and taking care of their things, okay? So don't lose sight of what we're trying to learn. Now, with that said, make it fun. He's four. And by the way, I say this from the position of this is the number one thing I do wrong. Guaranteed. Everything, my wife's like, dude, stop being so damn serious. You, like, no kid, how's this, Bobby? No one wants to follow you. Your kids are not going to want to be you because you're so hard charging and you got shit done. They want to see that, but they want you to do it from a place of joy and fun. That's appealing to a kid. So play, like figure out how do you get little Timmy to put his clothes on and make it fun. I race you, right? Oh, you're, you're naked. I'm naked too. Erase you, grab your pants, lay his pants on. This is what we're going to do. You got five minutes, you know, ready, set, go. Who gets fast? You know, like come up with strategies to make it fun. Now through that process, and I, and I do think, especially at this age, it's a little bit tough, like mental toughness is, is, but that's also how we learn toughness, right? That's what's so great about competitiveness and competitive sports is that extra rep you don't want to do but you do it anyway because you're pushing each other and then you learn a little bit of toughness, but competition is fun at the same time. So especially with our kids, try to figure out how to make it enjoyable. And in that process, we'll build some mental toughness and do it with them, like side by side with them, show them. I used to, I, I made this mistake way too many times. I'd be like, kids, you got to clean your room. And then it, I'd go off and do my own thing. I'm not teaching them how to clean their room. I just demanded something of them, but who's teaching them the quality and where to put things. And, and trust me, even if you showed them once, they don't remember. They don't know what quality looks like, how things should be done, doing it properly. So unfortunately, and here's the unfortunate part, that shit's going to eat up your time. <laughs> you don't have to, like, that's my complaint. Like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this, but you know what? I don't have time for my kids. So get in the trenches with them. Dad, you know, just the other day, dad, I'm afraid to go outside and take out the trash, right? It's 10 o'clock. My daughter's a little afraid of the outside. I'm like, all right, let's do this. We can do this. She's like, okay, okay, here we go. You know what I mean? And so, so I'm ha having fun with it. I'm like, okay, grab a flashlight, check around the corner, see anything. All right, we're good here. All right, I'll cover for you. You throw the thing in the back. You know what I mean? And, and, we, and we're having fun with it. And she did something that she probably didn't want to do. You know what I mean? Um, but she did it anyway because we made it a little bit more enjoyable. The other thing I would suggest, though, don't, don't um, rob them of the opportunity, though, right? When we're in the trenches with them or we're cleaning the room with them or like, hey, take out the trash. And like, dad, like every single time I take out the recycling, I, I, I'm not tall enough to reach out the thing. Don't go like, oh, well, here, hand it to me. No, no, you're like, oh, well, how could you get up higher? How, how do you get up higher? Oh, man. Is there something you could, you know, look around with some ideas, you know, and let them be creative and, and come up with a solution so they can start realizing, building some confidence that like, okay, I got this. Like I can figure these things out. And so don't rescue them, let them struggle, but be with them uh, and make it enjoyable. Those would be my, um, my recommendations. Okay, guys, I think we're going to call it, man. Um, so a couple of things that are critical that, uh, I, I, I mentioned them earlier, but we'll, we'll touch base on them really quick. So connect with Mr. Mickler on Instagram and Twitter at Ryan Mickler, M-I-C-H-L-E-R is, is the spelling of his last name, Ryan, R-Y-A-N. Second, Iron Council, our exclusive brotherhood. We open this up on a quarterly basis, right? It's been open for the last two weeks to start off 
eight, the first week of April in the new cohort group. If you want to start off in the IC in April, you need to join now. That's going to close roughly, I think, later this week. And then you're not getting in until you know next quarter. So if you've been on the fence, take some action. Join us in the Iron Council to learn more about it or to sign up. Uh, go to orderman.com slash Iron Council. If you're not ready this quarter and you're like, hey, next quarter, but I, you know, how do I know, how do I learn uh, when it's open again? Go to the website, sign up for the newsletter or follow Mr. Mickler or myself on the social. So then that way we can communicate that out to you uh, and stay banded with us. If it's not obvious, guys, what we're doing, if you're listening to this, you know what we're about. We know, you know what path and, and what problem we've decided to take on. So band with us, help us move this movement forward. And you do that by sharing episodes, by leaving a rating and a review, by connecting with us on social media, by sharing messages with other individuals. Guys, this, I can't stress how critical this work is uh, and how much it's needed. And we can't do it alone and we do it as a community. Um, and as a tribe. So band with us, uh, join us in those many different ways, help us progress this movement forward so we can make a lasting impact in the lives of, of men across the world. And, and then lastly, I'd like to say is just thanks for the support for you, for those that are have or have been banding with us. We, we greatly appreciate it uh, and it helps. And I, I feel fair speaking for Ryan when I say this, what the way you guys show up helps us show up even stronger as well. Um, whether it's with the, with the events that we put on or, or whether it's, you know, on the socials or, or here on the podcast. So it is greatly appreciated and we appreciate you guys, um, you know, joining us. So until let's see until uh, Friday field notes, take action and become the men you were meant to be.